My name is Henrik Böger, and I'm an associate professor at the Media, St Media and Journalism Studies Department at Aarhus University in Denmark. The last five years I have been looking at first sort of circulation of digital journalism, theorizing and looking at how, how the new media landscape is, is how content circulates in different ways than, than the analog media landscape and what that means. And that has led me into questions of temporality. I mean, how, how new technologies through journalism constitute new temporalities, not only speed, but also other ways in which we are forming more complex temporalities through digital media. My interest in time and media led me to climate change because what I could see without being an expert in climate change communication at all, looking at it from the outside, you could see lots of different times clashing in the way that climate change was being talked about and mediated by journalism. So you have the long stretch of ecological time, you have the more sort of short version of political time, you have industrial time, you have generational times, you have lots of different temporalities, of course, the temporalities of journalism itself. When you look at when and how climate change is covered, there are different spikes in the coverage, and they are often connected to specific events like the, the COP meetings, like the one in, 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 uh, in Glasgow. So, even though the climate change is an ongoing process underneath, journalism needs certain events to get to, to have an interest. And the political events and the international events is one of them. Extreme weather might be another, uh, protest might be a third. But just to underline that, that even though uh, climate change is a, is a sort of uh, incremental, slow, continuous process, Journalism comes in and out of it when there are certain events. And I think that mis mismatch to some extent is one of some of the problems that journalism has with climate change, that it, it needs an event. It needs a picture. It needs something that can make it concrete, something that can be, be the news hook, something that, that can be on occasion for writing about it. And, and that is, of course, the way journalism works. And that is very understandable, but for a sort of long drawn out process like climate change that is very uneven all over the world. Sometimes I would argue, or what some of the chapters argue in the book, that journalism has a problem with this kind of process because it's so, it's everywhere, it's continuous, and how do you cover something like that? Mark has this sort of idea that, that journalists should follow climate change in the immediate surroundings of where they are. So rather than showing a picture of, an ice, uh, of a polar bear on a melting ice flake somewhere, you should go out in your neighborhood and find out what does climate change mean in my neighborhood? How can I unravel some of the issues that are inherent in the, in the changes that we're going through? And, and also his argument is that all the tensions, the fights for resources, all the things that journalists normally write about, climate change comes into that. So you can find a climate story in almost any story. It's just a question of looking for it. And I think it's very true as what you, at, at, that what he points out, I think one of the, one of the problems that, that climate change journalism has faced, certainly in the industrial world, the world that part, can, partly can insulate themselves from some of the extreme fallouts of climate change is that for, for people like us in, in the rich north to really take this in, it needs to be brought close to us. And a lot of journalism, when they write about cop, cop, cop this number and that number, it's often writing about it as a big global problem, but not something that is really relevant for our day-to-day -day lives. So, so I think this idea of bringing it home, bringing it closer, I think is really, really important. Uh, and this is what Mark underlines in that chapter. And I think uh, sort of make it, making it something that you can relate to uh, in, in a more intimate manner. And I'm saying that partly also because, and this was part of the ideas behind the book, 
that uh, that this bringing it close uh, is, is sort of an answer to the fact that we, we don't think Hannah Morris, who was my co-editor, we don't think that, that, that the people don't change their behavior in relation or their politics in relation to climate change is not for a lack of information. We know, rationally, all of us, that we have a problem. But can we feel the problem in our stomach? Is it close to us? Does it raise our emotions in a sense? And I think that was one of the impetuses behind the book as well, because a lot of climate change communication is, is, is focused on science communication and is sort of premised on the idea that if journalists could translate the science well enough, we would all understand and we would all behave differently. And I don't think that necessarily is the case. How different newsrooms can use the expertise of other journalists or other experts and how they can collectively put together stories and have a, a broader story that they worked collectively on. And I think that is certainly a way forward, as you see also in investigative journalism, that collaboration has become increasingly important to deal with sort of big national, international issues like tax evasion or corruption or something else. So, so certainly, and I think, I think even though I said before that I don't think we need more science into journalism, Having said that, I think also it's important that journalists, in a sense, reach beyond their their day-to-day -day knowledge and try to to collaborate with with experts or maybe to to become experts a little bit themselves, looking into the science behind, to get a better understanding. Not necessarily because they want to translate that, but because they can that it sort of gives them a better foundation for writing about it. So I think that is one thing. I think the other rearranging the newsroom <clears throat> is, is, I mean, I'm no newsroom expert at all, but I think the big issue is here, whether climate change is seen as a beat, as something specific, or whether climate change will become part of all the other stories. So I think that is what sort of a newsroom will have to decide on, whether we have the climate expert and or whether we also ask our journalists to seek the climate story in local politics, in business stories, in all kinds of other stories. So it's a question of whether you're sort of isolated to a section of the newspaper or whether you make climate sort of integrated into whatever else you do. And I think people would, would, would approach that differently. But I think, I think also Mark would sort of argue in his chapter that in terms of fights for resources, money, uh, all these things that are normally a part of sort of how we think about journalism and what they should do. There's a climate angle to that if you want to find it. That does not mean that every story will have to be told as a climate story. But I think there is something to be said for climate being sort of pushed up within culture, stories, or within politics, or within finance, in order to integrate it more into what else is done rather than isolated as something for those specifically interested in the climate. A lot of people get sort of pushed off because climate change is such a complex issue. It deals with uh, obviously the science behind. It's about international public or p politics. It's about justice. It's about North and South. It's about rich and poor. And, and there's so much in there, it's so clump, complex, and it's spread over so long uh, and so many different places. So I think one advice would be to not be daunted by that complexity, but just find one corner and start digging there. And that would unravel some other things. And I think, you know, I think a good advice would be stop thinking that you can cover climate change as, a, as, as such. I think you can move into it from many different directions and uncover it from where you are, which is exactly Mark's point, uh, which is a more manageable way of thinking about it rather than thinking, I need to know so much in order to deal with this, but rather start thinking about what new deals are made in the companies around me. Do they think differently? Are they thinking differently about the future? Are they buying new products? What about the farmers? Are they looking of ways to, to change their crop?
Are they doing things that are related? And then start moving into those kind of stories because that is sort of what you usually do without having the pressure of explaining climate change and all the complexities at once because of course nobody can do that. It's impossible, which you can say about a lot of stories really. The other aspect I think of dealing with the present, the news, what is happening here and now, and looking into the future. So rather than only looking at the present and where we are heading, also sort of drawing into your coverage how we got here in the first place. And the argument for, for that argument is that in order to change the world towards a, a future that is more sustainable, we need to look back and see what are the relations and the structures that brought us into this to start with. So in other words, that we need to change some structures in order to move into a different future. And I think a lot of journalism is, is so, so much in a sense wedded to status quo that, that that is very difficult. But I think in order to really change how, how all of us relate to climate change, for, for in order to, to do something, we cannot simply have a status quo. We, we have to accept major changes. And I think maybe journalism is not quite clear, you know, ready to tell that story. In order to sort of deal with the complex issues, <clears throat> we don't necessarily need longer and longer form. We don't necessarily need more and more complex coverage, but it will have to also be part of, of more of quicker, smaller, condensed formats. Whether there's one ideal format, I don't think so. I think it will have to be a variety of formats that can sort of deal with it in different ways, uh, from the very short and perhaps more emotionally based to the more rational science based uh, and everything in between. In media studies, you talked about compassion fatigue. I mean, you look at different suffering and you see so much suffering that you sort of become numb. And I think it's, it, that, of course, is also the question in relation to climate change that, that some people, you know, because there's so much on it in different ways that people sort of get tired of it. And which is again why I think you need to get closer more emotional and closer to your everyday life. Because as long as it's distance, it's, it's sort of talked about as a big scientific issue, talked about as an international political issue. It's so much easier just to hold it out and say, I'm tired of hearing about this. But if it's about your street, if it's about the rainwater, it's about your people in your neighborhood, it's more difficult to distance yourself from it. So I think this again, bringing in closer, I think is a really important issue. I think one of the big differences to start with would be that, that, that people in the COVID-19 were hungry for information. They needed to know how, how widespread is it, what, is the, what are the dangers, how can we protect ourselves. So it was a real, a, a real hunger for information, which I think is, is different in relation to climate change, because a lot of people, as I said before, might be fed up with information about climate change. And I think also, to some extent, uh, as you talked about trust before, I think sort of some parts of journalism have gained more trust through the COVID-19 because they have been seen as sort of inf mediators of important, important information. And I think one of the big differences would be is the notion of crisis. Because I think with COVID-19, everybody was sort of driven by the notion of crisis and a crisis has an end, we will get over this. And the big difference with climate change is that it, it's not really a crisis in that sense, because we will not get over it. We have to live with it forever. I mean, some things will, will have changed and will continue to change. So it's not something that we can sort of, we can suddenly solve just as it is. We have to accept that some damage has been done and that will take a long time, if ever, to, to recuperate or sort of to come back to where we were before. And some people say that that might not ever be possible. Uh, so I think in that sense that the big difference between something that is continuous and something that we have to deal with here and now. And I think the here and now thing fitted much better to journalism because it was a crisis here and now and everybody could relate to it and everybody was hungry for information and how to deal with it.
So, so I think there's a big difference there, in, in, in the more, more differences perhaps than similarities. I think a lot of public discussion and the weight of science has moved us beyond that. So I think, I don't think speaking about climate change as if it is something that will, is more or less taken for granted based on science that is taking place and will have an effect. I think by fewer and fewer people are taking as a political stance. It's taking at sort of future facts. It's something that we have to deal with and it's not a political statement to say that that, that is happening. That does not mean that it's no longer a political issue because it is, as I said before, in relation to justice, it is a highly political issue. I mean, the rich world is still the ones that have the, by far the biggest footprint, and historically as well. So uh, we have done on the pollution, so to speak, in the north. A lot of people in the south are paying the price. And this goes back to what is said before, unless there might be some really drastic changing in how resources are distributed, we might perpetuate the problem. So at a very deep level, it's a highly political issue about justice and about allocation of resources throughout the world. But in question of whether you believe in it or not, maybe believe it is, is the wrong word, but whether you take it as a fact that this is happening or whether you question that, I think we have to move beyond that question.